There was a flash, and there was a pause, and there was an almost is like a surreal thing. You could see the fireball erupting. Huge between. fireball of uh, mottled red and orange and black. Many eyewitnesses describe lights streaking across the sky toward the plane. Statements suggesting that a missile brought it down. Investigators meticulously reconstruct the aircraft, searching for evidence of terrorism. They find none. The missile did not strike the airplane because there is no physical evidence at all to, um, to corroborate that notion. That official conclusion, according to a number of independent researchers and conspiracy theorists, is simply wrong. We got eyewitnesses saying there's missiles coming up from two or three different places. I'm 100% convinced that missiles were fired that night. I would say the overwhelming majority of pilots do not believe the NTSB conclusion. Would our government lie to us? Would they deceive us? Would they withhold evidence? Today, the wreckage of TWA Flight 800 is a haunted relic. But is it a monument to an exhaustive investigation or evidence of a threat we ignored at our peril? It is April 1997, nine months after the TWA tragedy. Contradicting more than 200 eyewitness accounts, the National Transportation Safety Board is prepared to declare the explosion a mechanical failure. The cause, say the nation's air crash experts, a spark in the plane's center fuel tank. But doubts persist about the credibility of this conclusion. Skeptics are vocal enough that the board's chairman, Jim Hall, feels he must respond. He writes a column for the Wall Street Journal entitled, It Wasn't a Missile. Among those reading it is a 52-year-old retired Navy pilot in St. Mary's County, Maryland, named Bill Donaldson. My brother read that article and he was just incensed. They haven't even brought the wreckage off the ocean floor yet, and he's telling the investigators what it isn't. Bill Donaldson is not someone easily ignored. The former attack pilot and accident investigator knows what makes planes fly and what makes them fall. Donaldson responds to Hall in a letter to the newspaper. He believes the evidence points to a missile attack, not mechanical failure. He joins the ranks of skeptics pursuing their own explanations for the tragedy. It's the beginning of a mission that will continue until his death in August 2001. I am, in fact, Commander William S. Donaldson, U.S. Navy, retired. Bill was the type of person that once he got into something, he was sort of like a pit bull. He'd just hang on until he was done with it. Donaldson begins to conduct homegrown experiments to test the government's theory that a fuel tank explosion destroyed the plane. He gathers an impressive network of airmen and crash investigators. They form a group called the Associated Retired Aviation Professionals. We've got a Navy Admiral, a retired chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as founding members. We've got aircraft engineers, aeronautical engineers involved. As the organization grows, Donaldson drafts his younger brother, Bob, a Bell Atlantic executive, into his personal quest. While Bob sets up a website, Bill spends six months tracking down dozens of eyewitnesses. Their descriptions suggest a missile attack may have caused the tragedy. It's crucial evidence, and he thinks the FBI is suppressing it. The FBI witness forms, the 302 forms, were held basically as top secret documents. Not even the NTSB was allowed to have copies of those forms. Among the witnesses, Paul Angelides, a structural engineer. Angelides was vacationing at a beach house in West Hampton, Long Island, directly opposite the crash site. The first thing that attracted my attention was a red phosphorescent object pretty high up in the sky and close to the beach. And it looked like it was changing direction and had a little parabolic smoke trail behind it. I then saw that object converging with aircraft lights. There was a flash, and there was a pause, and there was another flash. Um, and then ultimately there was a huge fireball. Nearby, bridge mechanic Mike Wire saw a similar glowing object. It seemed to go out at about 30 degree angle and it proceeded out to sea in a waverly kind of fashion. Walked over, disappeared, and a fireball erupted. Air National Guard Major Fritz Meyer was on a training mission 10 miles northwest of Flight 800 when he too saw lights shoot across the sky. I saw an explosion which I'm certain was military ordnance. There's no doubt in my mind. I've seen it many times. Bill Donaldson studies these reports and reaches a startling conclusion. What he came up with was at least two and possibly three locations where a missile left the surface and intersected with the airplane. Frankly, I was a skeptic for quite a while. It wasn't until I started reading all the details that I started to question the official lie. In 1999, the brothers received the flight's radar tracking information. Bob Donaldson spends months transforming the raw data into a diagram, a sort of snapshot of the sea and air in the minutes surrounding the crash. We took it second by second, blip by blip. A missile itself might be too fast and too small to show up on radar. But when it blasts through a target, the debris exploding out of one side of the plane should show up on its radar return. They're going to be big jagged chunks of metal that are blown apart. And jagged surfaces are very radar reflective. Exactly what Donaldson sees in the data. Sure enough, coming out the other side of the airplane was radar hits that otherwise should be there. And it was like, Eureka, you know, this is exactly what he said to look for it was there. It's proof, Donaldson believes, of a terrorist ambush. He theorizes that pleasure boats were transformed into missile launch platforms. In fact, 
There were several unidentified boats in the water that day, including one mysterious vessel noted by the FBI as, quote, traveling at 30 knots. There were also reports of Mideastern looking men who rented a dock, used it once, and never returned. These terrorists, basically what they've got to do is smuggle missiles into the country and then go out and rent a boat. Sometime later, as night falls, the men would have positioned two boats off the coast, straddling the well-known route for jets headed to Europe. 60 miles west at JFK Airport, passengers on Flight 800 settle in for the overnight flight to Paris. The crew completes the pre-flight checklist. The terrorists would have made their own preparations, unpacking shoulder-launched missiles, weapons easily available on the international market, and fairly simple to operate. At 8.19 p.m., Flight 800 lifts off and makes a left turn, heading northeast, parallel to the Long Island coast. Donaldson believes that as the plane climbs toward 14,000 feet, the men below have already locked the heat-seeking weapons onto its engines. The next step is chillingly simple. You wait till you hear a tone, which means that the heat seeker has locked onto a target. Once you get that tone, you fire it and forget it. On a prearranged signal, both crews fire. Missiles streak across the sky toward the plane. Donaldson believes the first missile explodes inside the left-wing fuel tank. This explosion would have turned the residual fuel in the center tank into a volatile mist. We believe that the second missile may have hit the airplane at that point and caused the center fuel tank to then explode. Within seconds, the plane breaks in half and falls two and a half miles into the Atlantic Ocean. The NTSB acknowledges that radar data do show the boat they call the 30-knot track heading away from the site immediately after the explosion before it disappears from radar. The identity of this high-speed craft remains one of the enduring mysteries of the night of July 17, 1996, even to the government's own investigators. We don't know where it is. We don't know what happened to it. Perhaps the boat existed. I, I don't know. We didn't find it. We didn't. The FBI didn't find it. Nevertheless, Donaldson's theory is contradicted by a nearly two-year official investigation. The FBI and the NTSB uncover no trace of a missile or terrorist boat. Skeptics not only challenge that conclusion, but the honesty of the investigation itself. For them to have reached the point they did, they had a corrupt, lose, compromise, steal, ignore, or subvert every bit of evidence. And every bit of physical evidence, that's exactly what they did. In the fall of 1996, investigators off Long Island, New York, collect the wreckage of TWA Flight 800, searching for the cause of the explosion that destroyed the plane and killed all 230 people aboard. But critics have begun to doubt the probe's integrity and to develop their own theories of what happened. Jim Sanders is a retired cop turned investigative reporter. At the urging of his wife, Elizabeth, a TWA flight attendant, he has flown to New York to, quote, sniff around the government's investigation. Jim Sanders had something that no other reporter had, and that is he had a source within the investigation that was always willing to talk. The source is 53-year-old Captain Terrell Stacy, who had flown the ill-fated jetliner from Paris to New York the day before the crash. Stacy, a senior 747 pilot, was assigned by TWA to help the National Transportation Safety Board with its investigation. But after three months, he has become disenchanted with the inquiry and agrees to confide in Sanders. And the first thing Stacy said to Sanders, and they barely knew each other, was, Jim, there's a cover-up coming on here. The pilot hopes Jim Sanders' law enforcement background will help him find the truth. The At their first encounter, he describes a chaotic investigation dominated by the secretive FBI. The NTSB was only seeing what the FBI wanted them to see. The NTSB wouldn't get the, the pieces of the plane until the FBI was finished vetting them. In a clandestine meeting at a Long Island hotel near the investigation, Stacy feeds Sanders more information. The 30-year TWA veteran is violating his confidentiality agreement with the NTSB and putting his career in jeopardy. Stacy, he was not a cloak and dagger kind of guy. He had a great career. He had a nice house. He had his kids in college and nice cars, and he had built a whole life for himself. Risking all that, the pilot hands over a stack of documents from the investigation. Sanders will soon become convinced that the data are at odds with the NTSB's theory that a fuel tank explosion caused the tragedy. The retired cop instead sees in the NTSB data a narrow band of damage across the passenger cabin. He interprets this as the path of a missile. On November 24th, the two meet at Stacy's home in Pottersville, New Jersey. Sanders shows the pilot a chart he's produced based on the leaked data. It highlights the damaged part of the passenger cabin. Stacy has noticed something strange in that very part of the wreckage. And that is in rows 17 through 19, right across from that right wing. There's a uh, inexplicable residue uh, trace right across all those seatbacks of those three rows. Sanders suspects that the red-orange deposit is the smoking gun, proof that a missile pierced the body of the aircraft. Captain Stacy believes the FBI is concealing its analysis of the material. He agrees to get a sample from the wreckage. Stacy takes a little piece of uh, foam rubber backing off one of the seats. Jim Sanders has the samples tested and leaks the results to a small newspaper in Riverside, California. The article reports Sanders' claim that his test results are consistent with incendiary rocket fuel. The FBI responds publicly, maintaining that the residue is just the glue used to hold the seats together. But the feds now know someone is stealing classified material evidence from the investigation. Once that story broke, the FBI came down on Stacy and Sanders and Elizabeth Sanders like a ton of bricks and arrested them all for conspiracy to steal airplane parts. Stacy and the Sanders couple are convicted, but none get jail time. Jim Sanders persists in his investigation. In 2003, he and Jack Cashel, an investigative journalist in Kansas City, publish First Strike, 
their analysis of the events of July 17th, 1996. Like Bill Donaldson, they believe terrorists were responsible for the destruction of Flight 800. But unlike Donaldson, they claim the U.S. military also had a hand in the disaster. Here's what I believe. I say this with about 80% assurance. I fully believe that there was a small plane filled with explosives piloted by Islamic terrorists. Cashel thinks the mastermind behind the plot is a Saudi dissident who in the mid-1990s had only recently come to the attention of Western intelligence services, Osama bin Laden. According to Cashel and Sanders, bin Laden has ordered a suicide attack in which a small plane would crash into a jetliner. On the eve of the Atlanta Olympics, it's a brutal act intended to cripple air transportation. I believe that the Navy was aware that they were on alert. We know that there were cruisers, missile-loaded cruisers, sighted up and down the coast of Long Island that no one had ever seen before. As the giant 747 slowly gains altitude, the pilot of the smaller plane would have fixed on his target and veered toward the jetliner. That's not a hard maneuver for a skilled pilot. All they have to do is get close and detonate. In Cashel's scenario, a radar operator aboard a Navy destroyer detects the terrorist plane turning towards Flight 800. Surface-to-air missiles are armed and targeted at the attacking plane. At the last possible moment, the order is given to fire. We believe that they fired two missiles. We believe the first missile inadvertently hit TWA Flight 800 along the right wing, not catastrophically. The uh, second Navy missile locked onto the small plane and blew it to smithereens near TWA Flight 800 and took it right out. Four months after the tragedy, on November 7th, Pierre Salinger, former ABC newsman and JFK press secretary, announces to a convention of airline executives that he has evidence that TWA Flight 800 was down by an American Navy missile. Yeah, Pierre Salinger uh, was not as fine as moment. As it turned out, that document he was handing was showing the press with some ravings of something on the internet. Uh, but of course, it, uh, it made the investigation take another whole road. Jim Kalstrom, head of the FBI's investigation, personally contacts the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to determine what U.S. assets were in the vicinity. His agents questioned sailors, even checked the serial number of missiles aboard the USS Normandy, the ship Salinger had named. None of those missiles were shot. They were all accounted for. And we know this for a fact where it was physically located. It was beyond the range of any of its ordnance on board the ship. Kalstrom, former director of the Bureau's New York office, has nothing but contempt for conspiracy theorists. They want to be on television. They want to sell books for their own reasons. The things that uh, some said were just preposterous. They were beyond reason and beyond... Uh, you know, the bell curve of logic. Oh, oh, July 17th, 1996. Kalstrom is at a retirement party for a law enforcement colleague in Manhattan. It was a nice July warm night when this tragedy happened. As he leaves, there's a chorus of beepers. Each delivers the same message. An American flag passenger plane carrying 230 people has gone down off Long Island. Kalstrom races toward the FBI's Manhattan Command Center. He was calling out orders to uh, his uh, agents and also getting in touch with uh, Louis Free, who was then uh, FBI director in, in uh, Washington. Slow down, slow down. As he weaves through traffic, his wife tells him that a close friend, the wife of a fellow agent, was on the plane. My wife and I had been on their wedding party, so it was personal uh, and professional uh, simultaneously. It became geometrically more personal as we went through the process. Within hours, Kalstrom tours the crash site by helicopter. It was a scene of immense emotion and immense tragedy. There were bodies that had blown out of the airplane and had taken this 13,000 foot drop into the ocean. So we don't get to the bottom of this, whatever the bottom is. Before dawn, Kalstrom has teams of agents working the case. Every reporter that was out at the crash, we all thought it was a terrorist act. You know, the FBI doesn't investigate accidents. They investigate crime. In fact, a communique received by an Arabic language newspaper in Beirut the day before the crash had warned, quote, tomorrow morning we will strike the Americans in a way they do not expect. Jim Kalstrom, the day after the actual crash, uh, was the first one to mention the word missile. We had over 100 witnesses, and that grew to over 200 witnesses that, that reported seeing things in the sky. Some reported them as ascending uh, in the sky towards uh, this explosion that the vast majority of them witnessed. In addition, air traffic controllers described radar traces streaking toward the plane before it exploded. There were some uh, FAA folks who looked at this and were a bit alarmed by what they saw. The information is relayed to the White House, where President Bill Clinton is briefed. If that was terrorism, uh, certainly it was an act of war in my view, and I think the White House was looking at it as a potential act of war also. At 3 a.m., National Security Advisor Anthony Lake gets a call from the President, ordering him to, quote, dust off the contingency plans for reprisal strikes against those responsible. The government seems convinced the nation has just experienced a terrorist attack. By the morning of July 18, 1996, the first pieces of wreckage from TWA Flight 800 have been retrieved. The plane had exploded in midair the night before, setting off speculation of a terrorist attack. These things don't happen. 747s uh, or any planes don't blow up in huge, massive fireballs. The FBI's investigation begins in an atmosphere of intense concern over Islamic terrorists. Three weeks earlier, a terrorist bomb killed 19 U.S. servicemen in Saudi Arabia. That week, Ramzi Youssef, mastermind of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, is on trial in New York. And the Atlanta Olympics, set to open in only two days, have inspired a flurry of terrorist threats. 
When Bernard Loeb arrives in Long Island to organize the NTSB's inquiry, he brings only a skeleton crew of investigators. Like most people, he assumes that this is not the scene of an accident, but of a terrorist attack. 747, 10, 15 minutes outside of JFK, goes off a radar suddenly. That smacks possibly a bomb, and if that's the case, it's going to be the FBI's problem, not my problem. But as Loeb examines radar data that some think indicate a missile attack, his attitude shifts. His experts say that the data really shows something else, an innocent electronic glitch. It was simply a misinterpretation, uh, work that was done perhaps a bit in haste um, that resulted in what uh, still exists today is this theory that there was a high-speed um, uh, track um, um, going towards the airplane that was, that was a missile. Nonetheless, the FBI's Jim Kallstrom has read eyewitness reports of lights streaking toward the plane. He believes a missile may have brought it down. Proving that, however, would be a daunting task. Here we have the evidence, the pieces of the airplane, in water that we now knew was 130 to 140 feet deep, 10 miles off the coast of Long Island. Navy and police divers work long, dangerous shifts in water eerily sparkled by hundreds of pounds of theatrical glitter from the craft's cargo hold. Piece by piece, they bring the shredded material to the surface. The debris is trucked to a nearby hangar, where teams of experts search for the source of the explosion. We had people in the FBI that have seen a lot of blast damage, so we knew the characteristics of how metal would look after it was blown up. When his experts find no indication of such damage, Kallstrom sends them back to look again. But within a few weeks, Loeb's crash investigators believe they have found where the explosion occurred, the center fuel tank. The garage-sized chamber between the wings had been nearly empty. Loeb theorizes that the residual fuel inside ignited, turning TWA-800 into a flying bomb. It had happened before. There have been 10 or 12 such accidents in the last 40 or 50 years. TWA-800 sister ship, a plane that came off the assembly line the same month, had exploded and crashed in 1976 near Madrid when lightning struck one of its wing tanks. All 17 people aboard had died. But a fuel tank explosion aboard Flight 800 didn't eliminate the possibility of terrorism. The FBI said to the NTSB, yes, we know the center fuel tank exploded, but we're trying to find out why it exploded. Did a bomb hit it? Did a missile go through it? Or was it an accident? Then on August 7th, a potential break in the case. As a result of scientific analysis conducted by federal examiners, microscopic explosive traces of unknown origin have been found Bomb-sniffing dogs detect explosives in the wreckage. We did find traces uh, in a two-sided tape that holds the carpeting down. Within weeks, however, the FBI changes its story, claiming the chemicals are not proof of an explosion. They say the traces were left over from a training exercise for bomb squad dogs three weeks earlier. It's a contention hotly disputed by critics. But Bernard Loeb says that, in any case, the mere presence of the chemicals is not conclusive evidence of an explosive device. We would have seen far more than just these trace amounts. First of all, we would have seen the, the pitting of the metal. We would have seen gas washing on the metal. We would have seen fragments in the bodies of the passengers. By the end of 1996, in the absence of such indications, Loeb is prepared to declare the crash an accident, even though much of the plane is still underwater. The area around the center wing fuel tank had been reconstructed, and our investigators were absolutely convinced that there was no possibility that a missile had physically struck the, the airplane or that a bomb had gone off in the airplane. But Jim Kallstrom isn't ready to abandon his criminal investigation. His agents have interviewed scores of witnesses who saw lights in the sky streaking toward the plane. They have read the terrorist threats. And could Loeb's experts have missed something? One of the uh, FBI agents had uh, taken a uh, paper napkin and put pencil holes through the paper napkin. And then he ripped it up and he threw it up in the air and let it fall on the desk. And he said, now you tell me where the holes are that I just made. You show me the holes. And he made his point so succinctly that they didn't know. Right, that's it. That's it. Kallstrom decides he wants to reconstruct the entire plane. Only then will he know for sure if there's any evidence of a terrorist attack. It was critical for us to look at this in three dimensions. You really can't tell anything in a linear array of a million pieces of an airplane laying, laying out on a hangar floor. His request sets off a bitter dispute between the FBI and the NTSB. We had the evidence that we needed already that it was an explosion in the center wing tank w w without any doubt in the minds of my investigators. It's unacceptable. Loeb's technical experts failed to convince Kallstrom. We had a couple hundred people that saw a missile. The FBI stands for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. You know, not the Federal Bureau of Speculation. The White House sides with Kallstrom and the FBI. Not only will the plane be rebuilt, but a three-mile circle of ocean floor around the crash site will be scoured by dredging ships. The big question on that realm of investigation, you know, could we find and did we find an expended missile tube or an expended missile motor at the bottom of the ocean? Kallstrom's determined search for evidence of terrorism seems like a waste of time to Bernard Loeb. 80% wasn't good enough, so we trawled the bottom of the ocean. Trawled and trawled and trawled. Got up more. And the, ch and the ch net changes were what? I mean, what, what changed? With 60% of the plane in the ocean, for someone to crow and, and yell about the fact that they know what it is, is preposterous. And this very difficult, technical, geometric, scientific 
shrinking globe of terrorism we live in. That would be the height of unprofessionalness. Delow, the Bureau's insistence on pursuing terrorism only made the probe more vulnerable to its critics. It prolonged this business of it's a bomb, it's a missile. And the more the federal government said that that was a possibility, the more the conspiracists had to be right. So when the law enforcement people finally pull out and say there is no bombing missile, the conspiracy theorists now can say it's a cover-up. April 1997, nine months after the mid-air explosion of TWA Flight 800. In a hangar in Calverton, New York, the NTSB reconstructs the shell of the aircraft from bits of wreckage scraped off the ocean floor. This was a huge, huge effort. Piece by piece, the, the pieces of the fuselage were hung off of the structure that had been built to house the fuselage. With 95% of the plane recovered, Bernard Loeb, who heads the NTSB investigation, has still found no evidence of a terrorist attack. There was just no place where there was a hole that a missile could have gone through the airplane out the other side. Instead, Loeb blames the tragedy on an explosion in the fuel tank, the result of a series of preventable mechanical defects and bad luck. The problems begin when the plane is forced to wait on the tarmac at Kennedy Airport. Two air conditioning packs located directly beneath the center wing tank were running to try to cool the airplane. The NTSB theorizes that heat from the air conditioning units cooks the fuel in the nearly empty tank into a volatile mist. The tank is designed to eliminate the possibility of those vapors igniting. The only electrical components within it, the fuel probes, operate under extremely low voltage. Could these safeguards have failed? We saw when we examined other 747s that it was very, very possible that you could have had a short circuit that would have allowed sufficient energy into the fuel tank for ignition. Loeb finds an indication of such a malfunction in the crew's own words. The 12-minute flight was essentially uneventful, except for the captain mentioning, look at that crazy fuel flow indicator. Something was happening with the fuel flow indicator. High voltage from some other electrical device, lighting, avionics, even a coffee pot, could have jumped across damaged insulation into the wiring for the fuel probes, disrupting the cockpit gauges and setting off a slow motion explosion in the fuel tank. If there was a short circuit, you could have had sufficient energy in the tank to be the ignition source. And indeed, we found that that was absolutely um, plausible. According to Loeb, a tiny spark becomes the catalyst for the destruction of the 300 ton aircraft and the lives of all 230 people aboard. The flame front would propagate through the vents and all of the, the complex geometry and develop pressures that would be sufficient to break the tank apart. Within seconds, the main structural support, the keel beam, is fractured. TWA Flight 800 is mortally wounded. More and more of the sheet metal started to fracture, almost like an unzipping. Finally, the nose separates, and tons of fuel from the four wing tanks ignite into a fireball visible for 40 miles. But the NTSB's conclusion is based on probabilities and assumptions. Investigators never find specific evidence of either a short circuit or a spark in the fuel tank. While we were unable to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's what happened, our conclusion was that was by far and away the most um, likely um, cause of the ignition. Following 16 months of unprecedented investigation. By November 1997, even FBI Deputy Director Jim Kallstrom agrees. Having found no evidence of a crime, he shuts down the FBI's investigation. We felt that we had enough of the evidence to reach that conclusion. And uh, we, we didn't feel comfortable about that two months earlier. I think Kallstrom was under a lot of heat. I think that there was people from the law enforcement community that were even pushing him to wind up the investigation. At his final press conference, Kallstrom feels it necessary to account for the scores of eyewitnesses whose reports had, at first, led him to suspect a missile attack. We thought it was going to be hard to convince the people that saw what they saw that it wasn't what they actually thought they saw. Experts that we talked with about memory recall, perception, um, indicate that what people believe they saw is not an act necessarily an accurate um, representation of what they really did see. The following program was produced by the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA is called upon to produce a video that becomes the centerpiece of Kallstrom's presentation. They weren't our first choice, but they were the ones that were technically capable of doing it because we wanted to show what the vast majority of witnesses saw and what the logical explanation for what they saw was. The CIA animation is designed to demonstrate that what the eyewitnesses saw were not missiles, but the fuselage of the decapitated plane as it shot upward. It's what comes to be known as the zoom climb theory. What they determined was that people saw the actual burn up of the plane. In order for this to be possible, the plane must have climbed two or three thousand feet before plummeting into the ocean. As soon as the nose dropped off, the center of gravity of the airplane shifted rearward. So it started to climb because the airplane had pitched up and the angle of attack now was greater. Eventually, Loeb believes, the fuselage loses momentum, dives toward the ocean, and explodes. But many who actually saw the explosion dismiss the video. That doesn't resemble anything that I saw. Uh, there were objects that traveled a great distance from outside of this plane uh, and converged on the plane. These objects didn't fly off of the plane. They came at the plane. That's not what I saw flat out. It's not what I saw came from behind, looked like it came from behind the roof of the house on the beach. The cartoon. I can tell you that from the moment I saw the first explosion, everything was down. The CIA are the masters of deception. 
That's what their business is. That's what they were tasked to do. They were tasked to deceive the American public. It's not only eyewitnesses and conspiracy theorists who dispute the government's conclusion. Aviation experts like Vernon Gross provide technical critiques. He has had a decades-long career as an aeronautic engineer, including a term as a board member of the NTSB. Aerodynamically, the airplane doesn't fly without a nose. You've got tremendous air resistance coming in. The whole idea of the airplane going up is wrong. It would come down. I've stated often and well again now, this building we're sitting in has more potential to climb 3,000 feet than that aircraft did. Perhaps no investigation will be enough to quiet all the doubts about TWA Flight 800. But the events of September 11, 2001, will put those doubts into a new context. In August 2000, the NTSB closes out its investigation of the crash of TWA Flight 800. The probe had been snorted in a tense atmosphere of concern about what many presumed was a terrorist attack. It ends with a 425-page report filled with charts, diagrams, and the techno jargon of the scientific treatise. In the end, the board offers only a probable cause an accidental explosion in the fuel tank. Bernard Loeb feels that science has eliminated all other possibilities, including a terrorist missile or Navy misfire. We looked at each and every one of these theories to see if there was any possibility that comported better with the physical data than, than, our, own, than our own theories, and simply had to conclude that all of these propositions failed in the test of is there evidence to, to corroborate them, and there wasn't. But loose ends and unanswered questions have encouraged critics like Jack Cashel to doubt the government's conclusions. If you believe that the center fuel tank blew, you have to take their word on faith that there was some ignition source because they couldn't find it. You have to believe that for the first time in the 75-year history of commercial aviation that a plane just sort of self-destructed. Years after the crash, Bob Donaldson carries on his late brother's private inquiry. We got eyewitnesses saying there's missiles coming up from two or three different places. There's 40% of the front wing spark that never recovered. So if there was explosive evidence, it didn't get found. To Vernon Gross, the TWA investigation raises questions beyond science, questions of trust in our institutions. TWA represents to me mixing of politics with science and technology. And I'm saddened by that because I've always been a defender of the NTSB, being wholly objective, not swayed by any kind of force uh, from the outside. The government's own actions and inaction have raised suspicion only in February 2004, eight years after the disaster, did the FAA recommend filling empty fuel tanks with inert gas to make them less likely to explode. I wonder where in the world has the federal government been for eight years if, in fact, TWA went down due to a center wing tank explosion. It is an issue not lost on the people who fly the planes. Shortly after the TWA explosion, Captain Al Mundo had an in-flight discussion of this issue with a fellow pilot. He said the FAA and Boeing thought that the center fuel tank was a problem. They would have filled them with concrete last week. <laughs> and I think that's a fair assumption. But immediately after Flight 800 exploded, the FAA did spend more than a billion dollars, not on aircraft, but on improved passenger screening procedures. Today, hundreds of websites, chat rooms, and unofficial investigators propose divergent theories about the cause of the TWA 800 disaster. Some believe it was a link in a chain of events that led to another tragedy known by its numbers, 9-11. We might have avoided 9-11 if there had been a heightened sense of urgency in the airline industry. The pattern here that I'm really concerned about, and that is, would our government lie to us? Would they deceive us? Would they withhold evidence? Uh, I just think that there's more to the story that the government's not telling us, plain and simple. There are two words that explain a lot of what happened, and those two words are national security. We have a national security apparatus in which stability and trust are more important than honesty and truth. And it cuts across all parties. Has our government failed us, or have the skeptics failed us by peddling theories based more on paranoia than facts? There was never, ever any political influence on me whatsoever to come up with any conclusion other than the truth. President Clinton himself, on numerous occasions, we talked about this investigation, and the Attorney General and the FBI Director, and their direction to me always was, uh, whatever you need to come to the conclusion, to come to the truth of what happened to this tragedy, that's what we want from you. This was the most studied and examined metal that uh, anyone has ever looked at. The FBI pushed to have trawling. They pushed to have diving. They pushed to reassemble the plane. Wouldn't Kalstrom or any of his people say, uh, I don't think that's a good idea to reassemble that plane. I mean, if we're covering this up, why do we want to do something like that? Don't we want to lock the hangar door and not let anybody in? Today, the reconstruction of TWA 800 is on display at the end.